Now, on a personal note, uh, I really appreciated uh, Rick's, uh, Brother Rick's talk uh, last, but when he started to give the talk, I said, oh no, he's giving my talk. Well, you know, that's a, a thing that speakers sometimes worry about is uh, overlap or duplication. Um, he didn't exactly give my talk, but you're going to hear uh, some repetition of certain lessons. And in fact, even with Brother Mark Davis, uh, he covered some things that I plan to cover as well. But you know, we all believe in divine providence and overruling providence. And so if the Lord has chosen to um, inspire speakers to speak on similar subjects or the same subject or have some overlap, then you can rest assured that the lessons that come out thereby are intended for our blessing. So if, uh, if you hear some duplication and some overlap, I hope you will take it uh, in that spirit. Our title, The Time Left to Make a Calling Election Sure, is based upon a text we're going to use as our theme text, Philippians chapter three, verses 13 and 14. And there the apostle Paul writes, brethren, I count not myself to have laid hold, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and stretching forward to the things that are before. I press on toward the goal unto the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Brethren, no matter how old a consecrated brother or sister may be, we are all moving forward to the end of our life on this side of the veil. The clock is running, and the days and hours, minutes and seconds we have left are fewer all the time. So here's the question. How are you using the time that is left? Now, you might think, well, I'm only in my 30s or 40s or 50s, so I've got a lot of time left. Well, if you think that, then you're missing a powerful point that Jesus taught. Namely, our lives could end at any time. Remember his parable about the successful farmer who planned to make bigger barns for his harvest and then take the time to enjoy life? Jesus said in Luke 12, 20, But God said unto him, Thou foolish one, this night is thy soul required of thee, and the things which thou hast prepared, who shall they be? Whether we are younger or older, we do not know the amount of time that Jehovah has allotted us to make our calling and election sure. So whatever length of time that might be, how do you plan to use it? Since we have consecrated our entire lives to serving God, our lives belong to him. We are not obligated uh, uh, to do anything other than what our covenant with Jehovah specifies. And that means we give our whole lives to him. We put him first in our lives through Christ. How are you doing with that? In our theme text, Paul tells us that there was one thing he does, forgetting the things behind and reaching forward to the things ahead. Now, it sort of sounds like two things, doesn't it? But really, it's one continuous thing that consists of a mindset and an action. Let's take the first part, forgetting the things behind. Now, for the Apostle Paul, forgetting the things behind meant forgetting his violent opposition to the gospel even approving the murder of the brethren. How would you have coped with that if you were in Paul's shoes? Well, Paul recognized that his sin had been forgiven. It was gone, no more to, no more to be remembered. Let's think about it, apply this to us. Brethren, what sins in your past are keeping you from the joy of your present relationship with God? Or what opportunities that you may have missed in the past are still bothering you, perhaps coloring your thinking with a little guilt? Well, to be sure, our consecrated lives can be filled with frustrations at times. The characters in Charles Schutz's famous Peanuts cartoon frequently showed us that side of life. Here's one where we find Lucy. She's philosophizing and Charlie Brown is listening. As usual, you, Lucy has the floor delivering one of her dogmatic lectures. Charlie Brown, she begins, life is a lot like a deck chair. Some place it so that they can see where they're going. Others place it so they can see where they've been and some so they can see where they are at present. Charlie sighs. I can't even get mine unfolded. More than a few of us identify with Charlie. Life's trials sometimes leave us unsettled and unsure. What, what is God teaching us? We know the experience is providential, but often we can't find the lesson. And then we may feel bad about having made a wrong decision or through inaction missed an opportunity entirely. Brethren, all of us have failures in our life. We don't like that fact, but it remains a fact. It was a fact with Paul. But we must move past those things 
and forget them in the sense of not letting them distract us from our goal. Now, we can sit and stew in our failures, or we can get up and continue on. You know, if any of you have been traveling and you make a wrong turn and go miles out of your way, what do you do when you find the mistake out? Do you stop and fret and turn around and go home? No, of course not. You go back to the point of the, of the mistake and then continue in the right direction. The same is true of our consecrated lives. You correct mistakes and go on. A key here is to go on. I remember a talk that Gene Burns gave some years ago in which he quoted most dramatically the words of Winston Churchill, uh, who gave it during the uh, dark days of World War II. And I'll try to do my best Gene Burns and best Winston Churchill's heel, but he said, never give up, never give up, never give up. I kept lazing it. And I think that uh, Ch Winston Churchill said after that, never, never, never. So dealing with failure is not a time to give up. Rather, we should see failures as stepping stones to a more intimate relationship with our God and new opportunities for serving him. Now that brings us to the second part, the action part, reaching and pressing toward those things which are before. The apostle Paul was laser focused on the finish line of the race. He did not dwell on the trials and sufferings of the way, but focused more resolutely with each new day, the opportunities of service. It is a race to the finish line of death. It is, of course, sacrificial death, but that's the finish line. Faithful unto death. Paul used the illustration of a race in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. He wrote, Know ye not that they which run in a race all run, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it for a corruptible crown, but we and incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached unto others, I myself should be a castaway. By the way, just as a footnote, uh, see reprint 5001, 5001 for an excellent resource on, uh, reference on the subject. So again, let's bring the lessons to ourselves. Are your eyes fixed on the goal? Will you refuse to let a single day go by without some service to others and some sacrifice for the truth? Brethren, if the truth doesn't cost you something every day, then perhaps you need to make a change. Now, these are high ideals. The reality is that we have many obstacles that slow us down. So the challenge is to rise above these. Paul wrote some similar thoughts in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And here's what he wrote there. Let us also, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising shame, and hath sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Brethren, this expression, lay aside every weight, is full of practical meaning for us. It bids us to review the activities of our life and make a value assessment. It really is a simple question. Do your daily activities involve eternal things or temporary things? Again, we have the apostles help in making these distinctions and we're gonna to go to, the, to really the scripture that uh, brother Rick used as his theme for our last uh, lesson. First Corinthians chapter three. We'd like to read verses 12 through 15. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he have built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So Paul is talking about eternal building uh, materials and ephemeral building materials, building materials that will last forever, building materials that will pass away. Now, in Brother uh, Rick's application, he was talking about the doctrines of truth that are eternal and of error, which is not. We're going to make application to the activities that come about from those doctrines. So another way of expressing the question is, 
what are you building with day by day? Are you building with materials that, that uh, upon which activities are based that will result in eternal good and pleasing the Heavenly Father or not? What building activities are filling your time day by day? Now, to be sure, we all have necessary and activities uh, in our lives that are not directly related to spiritual work. For example, providing for our earthly needs of food, clothing, and shelter, personal hygiene, care and maintenance of our earthly possessions. These are all things that are not directly spiritual. But after taking care of these things, how do we use our time? This is about how we use discretionary time. Make no mistake about it, dear brethren. Most of our discretionary time should be devoted to spiritual things, to eternal things, things building with gold, silver, and precious stones. This is, as Jesus expressed it, the Father's business. Each one of us needs to manage this on their own. Unless we perceive a serious problem on our brethren, we're to mind our own business about it. But remember, we are to render up a report unto the master at the end of our lives. Managing our time requires value assessment. Paul let us know about that, about value assessment of things in the world. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 7 through 11, he writes this. But what things were gained to me, those I counted as loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Notice Paul starts his thoughts off with, but his drive to serve God was still intact and just as zealous as it had been before his conversion. But now he had a true perspective, a divine perspective, and nothing, absolutely nothing that he had or had been before compared with the exceeding excellency of his current condition. And he understood that his present sufferings were a vital part of that blessing since they would lead to an indescribable reward. But brother, the issue is not about our accomplishments or achievements or the possessions we have in our earthly human life. The issue is about our attitude toward these things. If they occupy too large a part of our attention, then we may not have developed the divine perspective as we should have. If we are to attain that resurrection for which Paul strived, then we too must view all achievements of the flesh as loss for Christ. That conversion of mind is absolutely necessary to please God. Here's a poem about such a realization. I had walked life's path with an easy tread, had followed where comfort and pleasure led. Then by chance in a quiet place, I met my master face to face. With station and rank and wealth for goal, much Thought for the body, but none for the soul. I had entered to win this life's mad race when I met my master face to face. I had built my castles, reared them high till their towers had pierced the blue of the sky. I had swore to rule with an iron mace when I met my master face to face. I met him and knew him and blushed to see that his eyes full of sorrow were fixed on me. And I faltered and fell at his feet that day while my castles vanished and melted away. Melted and vanished, and in their place I saw naught else but my master's face. And I cried aloud, Oh, make me meet to follow the marks of thy wounded feet. My thoughts are now for God's saving of men. I have lost my life to find it again. Ever since alone in that holy place, my master and I stood face to face. You know, the sentiments of that poem reflect the experiences of many of our brethren that prior to their coming to the Christ, they had great aspirations, great goals, great ambitions. But all those, like the Apostle Paul, fell aside when they met Jesus and realized the wonderful truth of the divine plan. Let's take some more lessons from this. Brother, uh, Paul wrote, brothers, I do not regard myself yet to have laid hold on it. He says there uh, in uh, Philippians. Uh, what he means is to get it, we must be faithful unto when? Faithful unto death. You know, when Paul wrote the book of Philippians, uh, various commentators have it 61 or 62 AD, uh, and his death was uh, 64, sometimes as late as 67. So he was well down the road of his ministry and didn't have much time left. 
but he recognized that the full assurance of victory would not be found until he breathed his last. You know, there's a cynical epitaph for many Americans who drift through life uh, listlessly, not accomplishing anything, sitting on their couches, watching TV. You get the type. And it reads, died, age 30, buried, age 60. Well, curiously, this epitaph does have some application to our lives. We symbolically die at our consecration, do we not? But we're not buried until many years later after we trust a faithful life of the Lord. And it's those many years that concern us. How many years is it? Well, it's running low, isn't it? Well, now we've considered a lot of sobering thoughts uh, and sobering principles so far. Let's take a quick look at some encouraging things. And again, we're gonna to start to derive some more lessons from our theme text. First of all, God called you. You are not in the race because you decided to be, no. God invited you, he brought you to Jesus, he gave you repeated measures of grace to bring the truth to you. He made clear the invitation to the high calling. He begat you of the Holy Spirit. He has brought you into countless experiences, all designed for your growth and fitting in the kingdom. You see a pattern here, brethren? Yes, indeed. It is God who is working in you. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, we read, but now work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I love this text because this reflects the uh, principle of sanctification. Sanctification has two parts to it. It has our part and it has God's part. But sanctification is setting aside for this purpose that God has for each of us. Now, our part is the working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We have to have our part. We have to engage our wills and bring our wills in conformity with the will of God as much as we can. That's what we need to do. But God has a part too. And that's what the second part here. It is God which worketh in you. It is God working in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I really like that. God works in us so that we want to do his will. And then he gives us opportunities to do his will. And notice it says of his good pleasure. You know, we're working on another lesson that we have tentatively entitled uh, The Father's Good Pleasure. If you do a, a strong search or a, a, a search of that, that expression, good pleasure, Father's good pleasure, you find that it occurs a whole bunch of times. And it's really interesting to see what it is that gives God pleasure, what pleases him. And it's beautiful to make a list of that and then to aspire to, to uh, occupy as many parts in that list in our own life as we can. Here's another way that Paul expressed it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. He writes there, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God afore prepared for them that should walk in him. Brethren, you are God's workmanship. He's got a project going. And uh, Jesus is the project manager. But like with any project, all of the elements have to come together, and that includes your will and your desire and your cooperation. Now, unless you believe God made a mistake calling you, and I'm sure none of you believe that, then you may have complete confidence that our Heavenly Father, who is righteous and just and faithful, is more than capable of bringing us to that high reward. We must only submit fully and completely to his will. Put your confidence in him. All right, lesson number two. Remember, our theme is about recognizing that the time left in your life is limited. And all of us must use this limited consecrated time left to us wisely. We already saw the focus in single-mindedness of Paul when he wrote, this one thing I do. It was clear what his priorities were. Brethren, what are your priorities? God's word doesn't leave us without an answer. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 taught, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That seek ye first, that's a priority. That of all the things that are important in our life, the seeking of the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God ought to be right up there at the top. Now, is this a suggestion from Jesus? No, not at all. It is an imperative for all of the saints. So here's some follow-up questions. Are we living in accord with this priority? Are we obeying Jesus? Are we seeking the kingdom? And in fact, brethren, to seek the kingdom, we have to seek the king. 
So are you focused on Jesus? As Bible students, we preach the presence of our King. Do you live consistently with this message? Does your life have the present Lord in focus? We have a beautiful illustration of both the blessing and the consequences of taking our eyes off of Jesus. Do you remember the account in Matthew 14 where Jesus was found walking on the water? Turn to Matthew 14, verses 26 to 31. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit, and they cried out in fear. But straight away, Jesus spake unto them, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come out on the water. Let me pause here for a moment. You know, I love the apostle Peter. I identify with him because he has faults that frequently rose up to bite him. But he had such a good heart. He was zealous sometimes without thinking things through, but he loved the Lord and he wanted. And you can sort of see Peter on the boat, you know, with, with all of the wind and the waters going around and, and seeing this. And, well, he wants to go out there, but uh, uh, just to check, uh, Lord asked me to come out. Well, Jesus does. He says, come. And we, when Peter was come down out of the ship and walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And he began to sink. He cried, Lord, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, this is a lesson that we've seen before many times. But as long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, he walked on the water. It was only when his attention was arrested and his focus moved away from Jesus to the wind and to the waves that he began to sink. But please notice also who was there to help. Jesus is ever faithful to his called one, his bride. Believe it and be strong. Brethren, if we take our eyes off of our returned Lord, we risk sinking into the troubled waters of politics, social unrest, and civil upheaval. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Lesson number three. Paul wrote in our theme text that we must press and reach toward the goal. The NIV and a few other translations read straining toward that which is ahead. So let's put this another way. Brethren, we have to stretch ourselves. What are your comfort zones? I mean, those areas in your life where you're physically, emotionally, socially, spiritually comfortable. Well, here's an important question. Do we make decisions in our lives to preserve that comfort? Brethren, we must be careful not to get too comfortable. It is leaving our comfort zones in the service of Christ that will not only bring the greatest blessings, but may ultimately decide whether we make our calling and election sure or not. Stretching ourselves means pushing past and out of our comfort zones. Look at your consecrated life. Are there other opportunities to serve the interests of our Lord Jesus by stretching? Is there something new in God's service that you haven't tried before? Perhaps volunteering for a job in the Ecclesia that you thought, maybe I can't do it. Brethren, try it out. Stretch a little bit. I think the results will surprise you. Now, sometimes we get bogged down with doing things a certain way, perhaps by the book. We have habits. We do the same thing day after day. And perhaps in that mindset, we fail to see opportunities that would be obvious to others. Brethren, watch out for standard operating procedures. They can suppress stretching and innovation in our lives. For example, of uh, how ridiculously, mindlessly following procedures can be is an illustration of an experience had by humorists by the name of Robert Henry. He went to a large department store in search of a pair of binoculars. And here's his narrative. As he walked up to the appropriate counter, he noticed that he was the only customer in the store. Behind the counter were two salespersons. One was so preoccupied talking to Mama on the telephone that she refused to acknowledge that Robert was there. The other one at the other end of the counter, a second salesperson, was unloading an inventory of box onto the shelves. Growing impatient, Robert walked down to her end of the counter and just stood there. Finally, she looked up at Robert and said, you got a number? I got a what? Asked Robert, trying to control his astonishment at such an absurdity. You got a number. You got to have a number. Robert replied, lady, I'm the only customer in the store. I don't need a number. Can't you see how ridiculous this is? 
but she failed to see the absurdity and insisted that Robert take a number before agreeing to wait on him. By now it was obvious to Robert that she was more interested in following procedures than helping a customer. So he went to the take a number machine, pulled number 37 and walked back to the salesperson. With that, she promptly went to the number counter, which revealed that the last customer waited on had been holding number 34. So she screamed out, 35, 35, 36, 37. I'm number 37, said Robert. May I help you, she asked without cracking a smile. No, replied Robert, and he turned around and walked out. Now, we may laugh at such ludicrous behavior, but could we be so wrapped up in the normal pursuits of life, the normal standard operating procedure, the habits that we have to miss opportunities to serve others? In our interest to serve our brethren, are we missing opportunities to serve our own families or even our own spouses? Brethren, we must stretch ourselves. And in the stretching, we will find that our reach in the sense of what we can do will grow wonderfully. Paul had this attitude. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Wow, what a statement. I can do all things. But brethren, if Paul taught that and was true for him, it's true for you too. You can do all things for Christ. And of course, the all things are the things that God wants us to do. Now, please note, we must stretch in the direction of that goal. It is part of the focus that we spoke about earlier. Take stock of your spiritual resources. Can any of them be used more in the service of God, in the service of the brethren? It's a sad truth in life that we often have resources that lay silently in inventories that could be used. In doing some cleaning some time back, I came across a box of tracts and booklets stored away. It struck me that they do no good to anyone being stored away in my closet. These were valuable items of truth that needed to be gotten out. Now, these were pieces of literature, but the principle applies just as strongly to talents that you have. Are you sitting on talents or are you putting them to use in the Father's business? Remember, we are God's workmanship. We can cooperate with God. Ask the Father in prayer to be stretched. He will certainly answer that, that uh, prayer with a yes. In Psalm 143, verse 6, we read, I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after me, thee as a thirsty land, Selah. Brethren, the psalmist there was stretching himself unto God, and he was thirsting after God. Brethren, would that we could have that same thirst and would do the same stretch in order to be more used in the service of the Heavenly Father. When we ask him that prayer, it's a definite answer of a yes. We've been emphasizing the privileges we have in spiritual activity in the time left in our lives. But this spiritual activity must also include study and meditation in God's word. Remember Brother Rick's lesson, going back to the, the precious uh, things, the eternal things, gold, silver, precious stone, and the other things. These represent the doctrines of truth. It is the doctrines of truth that can strengthen us, that can direct us, that can give us opportunities or help us see opportunities in the service. Brethren, by faith we believe by God's grace, we can obtain the goal of service to God unto the end of our lives. We walk and we see by faith, that's true, but that faith is built upon the precious promises of God contained in his word. We can apprehend these promises only by study and godly meditation. Here's a text that very familiar to Bible students, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved of God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, if you look at the Greek there, the word for study actually means do your utmost. It includes study. Study is an absolutely essential part of doing our utmost. And if we neglect study, then we neglect something that's important to us. We have to recognize the importance of spending time in God's word. In the expressions of scripture, there are inspiration to us. Brethren, in the time left in your lives, you must allocate time for study and meditation. It is a source of strength for you that cannot be neglected. It is the way that Jehovah speaks to you most directly. You may remember in the Holy of the Tabernacle that they had uh, several pieces of furniture there. 
In fact, I want you to imagine for a moment that you are at the door of the tabernacle ready to go in and you go in through. On your left, you would see the golden lampstand with its seven lights or seven bowls that are lit. On the right, you have the table of showbread. Straight ahead, you have the golden incense altar. Now, these things represent various things. They have multiple meanings and multiple applications, but we're going to take just one, that they represent the word of God, specifically the golden lampstand and the table of showbread. Now, someone might ask, well, why would God have two symbols representing the same thing? Well, the answer is they represent two different functions of God's word to us. Remember, the only light in the holy was the golden lampstand. Again, that's on your left as you're coming in. This represents the light of truth we receive that gives us direction in life, assisting us to make the right choices and right decisions. On the right, we have the table of showbread. This represents God's word as spiritual food to us that gives us strength to go the narrow way. So spending time in God's word every day gives us the light, the direction, helps us to make decisions, and it gives us the strength, the spiritual strength necessary for us to go on with all the experiences that God gives us. Brethren, spend time in God's word every day. It's absolutely necessary for your health and growth. And remember again, there's only so much time left in our lives to enjoy this wonderful resource. Lesson four. Again, one more observation from our theme text. Paul notes that the prize is heavenward, away from the things of this earth. When we consecrated all to the service of God and sacrificed all on the altar to be consumed, the upward call of heaven takes special meaning. You know, in ancient times, whatever a sacrificer put on the altar, it was consumed and went upward, didn't they? Well, we have put our all, and it should be going upward too, and we should take notice of that. And when we go up, we go away from the world. Brethren, we must let go of the things of this world. Brother Fry used to use an example of the metamorphosis of a butterfly as a natural illustration of a consecrated life. You know, a caterpillar is a picture of our earthly flesh before consecration. You know, a caterpillar has all those legs, so it has many, many attachments to this world and to this earth. Now, at some point in the caterpillar's life, it receives this upward impulse. And so instead of being on the ground and eating, why it starts to find a tree or a twig or something, and it goes up and up and up. Then it finds a branch and it goes out and out again. And then when it gets to a certain spot, it connects to that branch. And then one by one, it lets loose of all of its legs until it is hanging all by itself on that one point. And of course, you know, at that point, it starts to weave a cocoon. And then a marvelous transformation takes place. That earthly caterpillar with so many legs and attachments to this earth becomes a beautiful butterfly. Now, the application to us is so beautiful. Brethren, when we receive the upward impulse, the invitation from God, now we start to seek upward things, heavenly things. And of necessity, it means that we have to let go of earthly things. All of those connections that a caterpillar had with the earth are let go one by one. And then we get into the cocoon of the Lord's Holy Spirit that affects that transformation to us. The cocoon cuts the, the caterpillar off from the whole world. So we have to become no part of the world, cut off in order to be sanctified, in order to grow. And of course, that butterfly, that beautiful butterfly, that's so different from a caterpillar. Caterpillar, a creature of the earth, a butterfly, a creature of the air. So too with us, when we leave behind this earthly carcass in this cocoon in which we're being trans, uh, transformed, we will come up to a heavenly plane as divine creatures. The key element in all this, brethren, is you got to let go of the things of the world. Attention to self is a downward direction of attention. As we learn to direct our attention upward, heavenward, we begin to see things from the divine perspective. For example, you tell me, can you see more from your lawn or up in a tree on your lawn? Can you see more from that tree on the lawn or a water tower in town? Can you see more from that water tower or a nearby hill? You get the point. The closer that we get to God, the higher our perspective is, to, the better we see spiritual realities. So the high calling is not just an abstract reward. It's a present reality. And there's a couple more scriptures that show the present reality of being risen with Christ. 
Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on the things above, not on the things of this earth. Ephesians 2, 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Brethren, do you live day by day risen with Christ? Are those heavenly places real to you now? Do you feel them? Do you see them all around you? Brethren, if we do, if we achieve that condition, we would expect the joy of each one to be irrepressible. We become willing to endure, to bear, to carry on any experience that the Lord gives us with joy in our hearts. In such a state of mind, the flesh becomes less and less important. The goal of pressing for the mark, perfect love and Christ-likeness takes more and more importance to us. Well, brethren, let's conclude. Let me give a summary of the lessons that we have discussed. Number one, our time on this earth is running out. The clock is running. You lose hours and minutes and seconds every day. Number two, we must live our consecrated lives recognizing this, that we only have so much time. Number three, value every hour in our consecrated lives as opportunities for service. Four, do not let the mistakes of the past distract you. Five, stretch yourself in various ways to expand your service opportunities. Six, let go of the things of this earth. Seven, keep your focus on upward things the goal of the prize. And last eight, ask our Heavenly Father for help to carry these ideals out. Brethren, I'll conclude by reading our theme scripture once again. Brethren, I count not myself to have yet to have laid, laid hold, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and stretching forward to the things which are before. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless this to you.